You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Hey everybody, welcome back to Pets Mean Business. I'm Jamie McDowell and I'm your host. We are really excited to be here as we always are. I think this is episode number 27 or 28, whatever it is. It's been a really great journey and I love how much you guys love what you're hearing about pet entrepreneurship and about innovation and about the people behind the brands that make up this big $63 billion industry. It's just, it's incredible to be a part of it. I love I love the intersection of innovation and personality with all of the opportunity in the pet space. And that's what this entire show is about. It's about bringing together not just, you know, cool pet products and cool pet ideas and cool pet, you know, anything. It's really about how those things come to market and how those things come to be and the struggles and the challenges and the highs and lows that are associated with all of those products and all of those dollars. And that's that's what I want to do. I, I've been in the industry for a really long time and I, I see all these people and I, I, I see these ideas and I meet these people and I, and I watch the passion and the fire and I watch all of these all of these ideas come to life and there are people behind all of those ideas and so this show is about bringing those people to the forefront and letting them speak for themselves and not letting their products or their businesses speak for them so it's a little bit of a flipping around of, of that so uh, it's been a really great show I hope that you're enjoying it I love the feedback that we get if you need anything from me if you have any ideas or you want to get some support or you want to meet somebody, you can reach me at jamie at petliferadio.com or jamie at fetchfine.com, whatever, whatever it is you need. Um, we're here to help. <laughs> Isn't that nice? See, you can, you can do this. And if you're sitting there right now listening and you're thinking, well, I, I either work with pets and I want to talk about my experience or what happens a lot is I want to work with pets. I want to be in the pet industry. What is this that I'm hearing about? All of the opportunity. I have an idea for a product or I have a business I want to start or I really like training dogs. You can do it. You can do it because so many people are just like my guest today. You know, it's about being innovative and thinking and being fearless. There's a certain amount of fearlessness that goes into entrepreneurship. Regardless of industry, there's a certain amount of fearlessness and a certain amount of risk. And if you feel like you fit the profile of being able to kind of play in that space of fearlessness and taking risks, then and you love animals, we want you. We want you in our industry. All right. So speaking of that, today we've got someone who's actually done something, I think probably one of the cooler ideas a uh, really interesting way that she has um, pivoted her background, her passion, and she's brought those things together and, and leveraged all of those things in a very interesting way. And we're going to meet her today. She is a Chicago, and I always say that when there's someone on my show who's from Chicago, I always want to make sure that's clear because there's a relationship there. And that's a really nice thing about being in a big city that's very pet friendly, that I know lots of great people, and I get to have those folks on the show. So today we're going to have a guest on, on my show. Her name is Alicia, and she is she's a master's in counseling psychology, which you're thinking, well, how does that have anything to do with the dogs? It does because she had a concentration in children and adolescents, and she practiced as a child and family therapist for many, many, many years. And after doing that, she decided that she wanted to go work in politics, and she wanted to look at how she can bring about some change for families and communities. And it was during this time that she started volunteering at an animal shelter, and that's how it happens for people. They take a passion, they see an opportunity, and they move towards that. And then things start to evolve. And as she was volunteering at this animal shelter, she all of a sudden became really involved in the Chicago animal welfare community. So then she decided to leave politics and follow her passion for helping animals. And that's exactly the whole point. And I think that Alicia is a great example of all of the things that make this industry so beautiful. It's about following a journey, being open to all of the elements within that journey and whatever may happen. And so, you know, she started working in an animal shelter here in Chicago, then the largest Chicago veterinary emergency clinic here in Chicago. She continued to volunteer with kids. She ran a, a club, a block club on her in her neighborhood for many years. And all of a sudden, as she's gone down this path and she looked at opportunities and was mindful of who she was and mindful of what was available to her in the pet space, she developed a company. She developed a company called Pitter Patter Parenting. And what she's done is she's found a way to bring her love of animals and also her, her love of families and kids. And so her entire mission with her company is to help families manage their kids and their pets together safely 
but at the same time honoring the bond that the people have with their pets because we know that there's a big problem and Alicia and I will talk about this when she comes on that people have kids when they already have pets there's established pets they bring kids into their family and everything changes their relationship with their pets change their concerns change the concerns become deeper and wider around the health and safety of their pets and those relationships and Alicia has found a really nice way of inserting herself in that relationship and creating a business opportunity out of it so when we get back from our break I will have my wonderful guest on, and we will talk all about pitter-patter parenting. And I can say that 10 times fast. Can you say it right now in your car, wherever you are with your headphones on? Say pitter-patter parenting, right? You can say that. It's cool. Uh, so uh, when we get back from break, Lacey will come and join us, and she'll tell us more. And we'll talk about you know, how to do this, how to make something your passion into something you can do on a daily basis. Because like they say, if you love your work, it's never a job. Or if you love your job, it's never a work. Whatever it is that they say, I'm pretty sure Alicia feels that way. All right, guys, we'll be right back. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Your pets will stay warm for the winter and be runway ready. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com Hey everybody, thanks for sticking around. Jamie Migdahl, your host, Dis on Pets Mean Business here on Pet Life Radio Network. And we have with us, like I mentioned before the break, a really special person who has taken the idea of entrepreneurship and innovation in the pet space and done something really creative and amazing. And I'd like to welcome you to the show today. Hello, Alicia Bondo. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Oh my gosh, it's a pleasure. And I always, uh, in the introduction, I talked about the fact that I've known you for a long time. And I always like to make that transparent because, you know, there's a comfort that you and I will have as we have our discussion today that, you know, even though I'm cool and you're cool and this is a cool format, you know, I still think it's important to be like, hey, listen, we know each other. We've hung out. In fact, we were roommates at one point. That's right. Know. That's how we met at dog camp. Oh my God. Is that how we met or do we already know each other? No, I think that's how we met. <sighs> That's awesome. I don't think I realized that. So there's this um, <laughs> place here in Chicago, which is, by the way, awesome, called Camp Dogwood. Um, mm-hmm. And it's this, it's, it's a cool organization. It's these two people, two entrepreneurs who um, do this as their side project, but they rent out camps that kids go to. They rent out camps in off season and they put together programs where you can do swimming and agility and there's workshops and arts and crafts. That's literally an overnight camp for people with their dogs. And so Alicia has been, how long have you been going to camp? Um, I started going with the very first session in the fall of 2001, and I often credit Camp Dogwood with getting me into the animal welfare world. Oh, really? How, did, how was that? Did you know mm-hmm. people? Did you meet people there, or how'd that go? Yeah, once I started going there and taking all the workshops and meeting all the people, I realized that this was my community. This is where I needed to be. So did you go to camp in the beginning because you just loved your dog and you were looking for something cool to do? Or were you looking yeah. to... Uh, so it wasn't that you were looking for an industry to get in, involved with. It was just you going as a, oh. as a customer. Right, right. And I did actually just... I stayed working outside of the pet industry for many years while going to camp. It did take a while to make that transition from volunteer to to employee. Were you supported when you were doing that? So when you were working as a, a therapist and then working in politics and you started to see, feel the pull towards animal welfare, how did the people mm-hmm. in your professional community respond to that, to that shift? Well, you know, I think as most of us in the pet industry have experienced, we're not always taken all that seriously, you mm-hmm. know, because it's, you know, pets are a fun hobby. It's a cute thing to do but it's not serious, it's not professional, it's not, and definitely can't be, you know, revenue generating to the extent that it needs to be, you know. So it, there does take some convincing of family and friends that you're more than just, uh, it's more than just a hobby, that it, it's a lifestyle choice, a career path. 
It's funny because we always laugh about the pet industry, just like you so beautifully said that people think about it and they think all you do is play with golden retriever puppies in the poppy fields all day. Where, <laughs> where clearly you and you're able. wasting your degree right, and you know <laughs> right, 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 right. You can be doing so much more for people, you know, when when really, as you and I both know, and your business is absolutely testament to that, which is working with pets is actually working with people, right. Mm-hmm. It is. I mean, I, I have found that to be true throughout my entire career. And, and the people who I admire and respect most also are first to say that, that, yeah, that's the pet industry for sure. And that's the conduit. You know, the pets are the conduit to every other opportunity. But it's really about it's a relationship um, industry. And I think that the people who do the best in this industry recognize that and, and know how to navigate and negotiate that. So let's actually, if you wouldn't mind, I don't usually do this in the show. I usually like to just kind of have a conversation about more, you know, really about you. And, and I want to make sure we do that because I think that you're incredibly fascinating. But let's talk about your business because it is so unique. And I think that, you know, this whole idea of innovation and looking for revenue opportunities and stepping outside of comfort zones. I think you've done all of those things as you've developed Pitter Patter Parenting. So I'm going to let you go ahead and just tell me, you know, like, let's just pretend that I knew nothing about it. How would you describe this to me? Okay, sure. Um, well, first, I just wanted to mention that it, I started with a nonprofit that I started four years ago, and it's called Pets Are Like Family, and that's helping families with limited resources care for their pets. So that was kind of my first journey in helping families with their pets. It's a different situation because we're helping them with things like, you know, financial assistance and things like that. But that was kind of my first arena in getting into the homes, working with families, dealing with children and how they interact with pets, and helping to make sure that the pets are safe. Um, You know, I think a lot of times there are people who help children and there are people who help pets, but there are very few people who go in and help both. And it's not just about keeping children safe, which obviously is a huge goal. We don't want our children getting injured, but it's also about keeping those pets safe and making sure that the dogs don't end up in a shelter because they growled or, or something like that. You know, something that perhaps was totally preventable had the family had the tools necessary. So that's kind of how Pitter Patter Parenting started was my my desire to work with families and to work with pets, my passion for both and putting them together because so many people nowadays think of their pets as family members and they want to do what's best for their pets. They want to take care of them, um, you know, medically and they want to take them to dog training classes. You know, they want to do all those things they need to do, but then they often don't have the information about, you know, the interaction between the children and the dogs because there's very little education on that. So that's what I'm trying to do is going in, helping families select the appropriate pet for their family, integrate the new pet into the home, teaching kids the appropriate ways to interact with dogs, and teaching the parents, uh, hopefully through through them just observing, so that they can reinforce those concepts with their children. I think we've all seen those, you know, really cute photos on Facebook of kids riding the dog or, you know, hugging the dog really tightly. And those of us in the pet industry cringe because, you know, that's not what we would recommend as far as appropriate interactions. But teaching parents why that might not be a good idea. And so that's kind of what pitter-patter parenting is all about. So are you up against, I mean, so like you just mentioned with the Facebook photos and all the, the memes and things, which, yes, mm-hmm. it does make all of us in the pet industry cringe. I mean, you're up against a cultural phenomenon where we've made pets, and we'll talk about, let's just talk about dogs, I think, in particular. I, and I, I don't, mm-hmm. I, absolutely, I absolutely believe and know that cats are also subject to all of these issues, but let's just talk mostly about dogs here. You know, you're up against a cultural phenomenon that, says that dogs have, you know, that we've anthropomorphized dogs to the point where we've hurt them. So just quickly anthropomorphizing um, for those of you who don't know what that word is, because it's a a word that we all know what it is. We just don't know that proper terminology. Anthropomorphizing is where you assign human qualities, feelings, emotions to an animal. And uh, the belief around that is if you do that enough or do that in the wrong way, that you miss the cues, you miss, you, you, you overlook the needs of an animal and you just don't understand, you know, you're not putting the animal in the right context. Um, so anthropomorphizing is something that's being done so readily and so often in, in media, especially, but also just conversationally as well from person to person, pet lover to pet lover. So given that we're at such a high level of anthropomorphizing and with social media, it obviously becomes even more of a conversation. How does that work? How is that hurting or helping you in making those messages clear to parents about proper care of pets um, with, with, with kids around? 
Well, I think that you touched on a really important point here, and that's that people need to understand what is a dog. <laughs> you know, how is this creature communicating with us? How is this creature trying to send us messages? And, we, and, you know, how can we read the messages that they're trying to send us? So, you know, we want to make sure that we're understanding what the dog is trying to tell us and that we're able to communicate to the dog so the dog understands what we're trying to tell them. They don't speak English, like you said. They're not, they're not humans. They don't feel the way we do the same things we do. They don't understand the language that we speak. So it's really teaching families what a dog is all about, how to interact and communicate with that dog so that they learn what is acceptable in our homes and in our families, um, so they learn to live with us, and that we also learn to respect them and what their needs are, because they're not children with four legs. <laughs> they don't think and feel and speak the same way as kids do. So it is a lot of, uh, of learning, really just the basics about dog behavior, dog communication, and how to integrate that then into the family that you have. Do you feel like it's an uphill battle some days? And I don't mean to bring negativity into this. I just oh, want to get a, I just want to get a I just want to really I think we need to have an authentic conversation about what this really is versus what people might think it is. I think there's a lot of barriers that come from families or individuals history. Oh, I've always raised dogs mm-hmm. this, these dogs mm-hmm. this way. Or mm-hmm. in, you know, if they come from another country, which happens a lot in our nonprofit, you know, well, in my country, you know, the dogs just roamed around outside, you know, nobody fixed them, nobody gets it because mm-hmm. they're animals, you know. And so there's a lot of cultural, generational stuff that you have to get through. And then there's just a lot of really bad information out there as well. So people, I think we all know the one trainer that we all love to hate, (laughs) if you can call him a trainer. And, uh, you know, people like to quote him. Well, you know, I read in his book or I saw in his show that this is what you're supposed to do. So you are often fighting some misinformation that's out there that people have gotten really accustomed to and trying to show them that, well, maybe that's not going to get you the results that you desire, which is really what it's all about, is doing what, what you're talking about going to get you what you need and what your animal and your children need. It's interesting because it makes me think taping this and this is the end of July. So we're in the middle of all of the, <laughs> I promise I'm going somewhere. We're in the middle of all of the convention, you know, the conventions, Republican and Democratic national conventions. So there's a lot of political rhetoric flying around and there's just so much social media and there's so much angst and so much emotion and so much stuff. But one of the things, one of the things that I find fascinating around this, and really it's one of the things that I find the most frustrating. How about that? but also fascinating, is that there are facts and then there are opinions. There are facts and then there are feelings, right? There are facts and then there are experiences. And the reality is that, and I think that we're seeing this a lot in the political climate right now uh, in between the two parties and the two candidates. And I think I don't need to speak much more to that right now. That's not this kind of podcast. But the point is that you just can't, when something is true, it's just true. We have statistics, we have, you know, we have studies. I mean, we just know that, you know, this is a factual thing. I don't know how you may feel something about it, you may think something about it, but it still is what it is. I find mm-hmm. that there's a I find that there's an analogy in dog training or in, in dog behavior just like that. Right? It's the same thing where someone may feel a certain way about dogs or about their dog, but it is still what it is. So I think that when you're talking about, you were referring to Caesar Milan, I think that when you're talking about, you know, Caesar's opinions about things or his take on things, that's an opinion and that's a thought, but people cling to that so much that they're not willing to understand that there's actually a whole science behind dog behavior and dog training. And there's a whole bunch of really smart people that have dedicated their entire world and their entire life to studying all of the different elements in dog behavior. And that's the stuff that we want to make more publicly. We want to bring awareness to those things and not just what seems what drives emotion uh, or what comes from emotion. And I, I, I know, you know, I think that that's for you, I'm sure working with kids and dogs, that's got to be a huge thing for you because I'm sure you're hearing all of the time people talking about their feelings about something mm-hmm. with their dogs. Like you said, they're, you know, what their grandfather did or their father did. It's, these things are irrelevant, but yet they become the most relevant. And, well, and I think, too, when you're working with families, with pets, you know, in today's Google world, everybody wants to Google mm-hmm. things. Everyone wants to do their own research. Right. So it's really pointing people in the right direction of that research. You know, if you would like to read more about this, 
here are some well-known, you know, qualified, respected resources for you to read about these issues. You know, this is where, like you said, the studies have been done as opposed to, you know, the opinions over here. And I know when I worked at the veterinary hospital for many years, that was a big concern is that people, they called it, you know, Dr. Google. People would do their own <laughs> diagnosing and everything because they read somewhere on Google and, you know, it's real. the doctors really have to explain to them, you know, again, what what is true and what is anecdotal information. So I think obviously the same is true with training and any kind of pet care is really helping to point people in the direction of what is factual versus what is opinion. I agree. Okay, let's take a break on that note and we'll come back and talk more about some of the tools that you use and some advice you'd have for people who are either struggling with their own animals and their families and also, because this is a business podcast, also talk about, you know, what your journey has been, how you got to the place where you were able to, you know, move your business from a nonprofit to a for-profit entity and, and how you're going about solving some problems around that. So um, thanks for all of this. This is awesome. I'm so glad you're on the show with me. This is a terrific, terrific conversation as I, as I totally expected it to be. All right, you guys, we'll be right back. <laughs> you're welcome. We'll take a break. We'll be right back with Alicia. When I adopted her, she was a mess. Scabs, itching, licking, missing fur, hot spots, a thin, dull coat. So I take the dog to the vet for the standard run-of-the-mill tests and treatments. No results. I hear your advertisement on the radio. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. 859-428-1000. So I get the five-pound box of Dynavite and the Licko Chops. Within a four-week total, instead of a German Shedder, I have a German Shepherd. Sheba is a 105 lean pounds of shiny, smooth, happy dog for life because she gets fed Dynavite. And the results, they're just incredibly outstanding. And she loves it. When you rescue a dog, you have to do the right thing. You've got to feed him right for life. Do the Dynavite. <gasps> Dynavite for life. 859-428-1000. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E oh. dot com. Hi, I'm Dana Humphrey, the founder of Whitegate PR. We have been specializing in PR and marketing in the pet industry for over 10 years. If you have a pet product or service you would like to promote, give us a call. We can help create awareness for your brand on TV, radio, magazines, newspapers, and blogs. Feel free to reach me directly at 619-414-9307 or learn more on our website at whitegatepr.com or follow us on Facebook. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Dot com. All right, so you're still here. Alicia, I think they're still here listening, so I think that uh, they must think that you're pretty cool, like I do. Well, <laughs> so, I think you're pretty cool too, Jamie. <laughs> well, yeah, All right, so let's now talk a little bit. Let's move from kind of beating our heads against the wall about why people are having a hard time understanding facts. But again, it is, you know, pets are emotional, and we know that, and we are here to support those folks to get to, you know, come into the light, so to speak. So what are some of the biggest challenges, not even the challenges, what are some of the ways that you help people? What are some things that you see, and I want some. I want to talk about some very specific things. It's easy to talk about big picture, but what are some ways? Give us an example of kind of what's the most. How about this? Let me let me rephrase. How about this? What's the most common theme amongst your clients? Well, with the nonprofit pets are like family, which continues to run, by the way. The biggest challenge is finances because these are people with limited resources, and they're looking for assistance with spay neuter vaccinations medical things like that and also free pet food which we offer to our pet pantry but we meet with them in their homes which to me home based services are so important because you get so much more information from clients when you're in their own environment when they're at ease in their own environment and when you get to meet all the family members animals and people to see how people are interacting where the animals are being housed fed all that kind of stuff so with those families um, that's the biggest need really is 
is helping them financially. But when you're meeting with them, you're also not just giving them a voucher for vet vet care, but you're talking to them about how the children are interacting. If you're talking to them about some grooming suggestions you might have if you see that the dog is matted, things like that. So those families is kind of just your basic pet care information. Now with pitter patter parenting, it is specifically geared towards children and pets. And you're right, usually it's dogs. People don't seem as concerned with safety issues and things like that with cats. Although, you know, there are other concerns as well with cats and, and other pocket pets, such as health issues and things like that. But with dogs, it is usually a safety concern. And helping families on the front end by letting them know that there is a way to go about selecting the right pet for their family. It's not Mm -hmm. just an impulse decision because you saw a cute puppy. Is, first of all, a puppy right for you? Do you, you know, how do we analyze what your needs are? You know, how old are your children? How much time do you have at home? Uh, What are your financial resources? Who's going to be responsible? All that kind of thing to let people know this is a 10, 15, 20-year commitment you're about to make. You know, it should not be an impulse decision. Let's talk about it. Let's put together a plan for selecting the right pet. And then once they bring the pet home, how do you integrate the pet into the home? Where is he going to sleep? Where is he going to eat? Do you have the supplies ready for that? How are you planning to potty train? You know, What are the best ways to manage your pet to set it up for success? It's much easier to teach them, right, the right things to do than to try to fix the misbehaviors later. So, you know, helping all of that situation, getting them set up, and teaching the kids from the beginning how to interact appropriately with the pets so that everybody is, you know, getting along in a safe way. And then there's always the families who don't have any kids yet and they're expecting their first baby and they have a dog and they're fearful of what might happen. Some people already decided that they're going to have to give their dog away because Mm -hmm. they're expecting a baby. You know, unfortunately, in some situations, that might be the solution. But in lots of situations, it's not. It just requires some work on the front end to get the dog and the family ready for that introduction. So those are the kinds of things that I do with pitter-patter parenting, helping families directly. I'm also teaching classes, dog bite prevention classes and pet care classes to children at different facilities around the city. And I'm really enjoying doing that and hopefully planting those little seeds in those little minds that they are taking home with them to help the rest of their family learn these things as well. I didn't know. I don't think I realized that you were doing that. Maybe I knew that at one point, but didn't know that that was, well, that's whatever. The point is that's, that's freaking awesome. I mean, that's, yeah. listen, I have a four-year-old kid who's obviously being raised in a very pet centric household, but, and so she's, you know, she's mostly, mostly appropriate, but we have, you know, friends that come over and they're afraid of dogs or they grab their tails or whatever. I mean, any number of things, mm-hmm. and of course, you know, we do our best to protect our dogs and cats from, from all of those things. But what really, you know, really shocks me, I guess Eh, maybe shock is too hard of a word, but what what I always find interesting, at the very least, is that people haven't taken the time to help acclimate their kids to dogs. They're giving them very basic, fundamental lessons around humane care or humane treatment of animals. I mean, that a kid would think right. it's okay to grab a tail or to step on a tail or to poke a cat in the ear or whatever it is. It's just where mm-hmm. why, is, why is that message not being why is that message not being um, sent through or, or being translated to the kids? But you know, I also understand that you know out of sight, out of mind, I get that. I get that too. But well, and that's think, a good point. It's not just about kids who have pets. All children need to learn these things because exactly they're going to right. go to the home of a friend right. who has a pet. They're going to be at the park when somebody sees a stray dog, That's you know, right. or just walking down the street and somebody's walking their dog. How do you approach that person? Do you approach that person? Which um, is why what, what do you you're do doing when is a so- stray dog comes along. Well, yeah. I mean, that's the whole thing. That's why, I mean, I didn't know you're doing this education. So are you doing anything in the school systems? Not yet. Um, that would but, be amazing. Uh, right? That is that a big part of what I'm doing now is marketing my services to child care facilities. I've been doing a lot of networking with child-oriented businesses. I just had a networking, I hosted a networking reception actually two weeks ago, inviting child-oriented businesses from Lincoln Park and Lakeview. And it was a great event where we all got to really meet each other and find ways to partner together. So for instance, last Saturday, I taught a class at a health club at an FFC Lincoln Park health club, because once a month they do a parent's night out where the parents go on a date and drop their kids off at the health club for, you know, pizza and playtime, but they always have an educational component. And so I was their guest speaker last Saturday night. So there's lots of opportunities to get the word out there. So I'm just looking to partner up with those kinds of places that once they hear about me, they're always very eager to have, you know, me come in and work with their kids. So this is a little bit, we'll take this conversation offline, meaning, you know, we don't need to talk about it right now on the, on the radio, but this would be a great 
this topic and this would be a great topic for fetch find platform i think we need to do a class on fetch finds platform we need to have a landing page you know within our marketplace we have all of these courses would you be interested in being the provider for that course and we can either you know it can either be revenue generating it can either be you know with, with our whole marketplace we can either charge sure. money for classes or can just be a way for you know giving back to the public but let's make sure we have that conversation on a couple of weeks and think about how you want that to be positioned because you're right like this needs to be something that isn't just it needs to be less about you pushing this down people's throats and more about people coming to it organically and just having a general interest in being able to access that information as easily as they can. So let's make sure we talk about that because it's a perfect fit for our fetch find users and our audience. So let's make we'll, we'll do something with that. I would I would love to do that. I'm actually doing a webinar at the end of this month for the Bump Club. Awesome. Which is a, a, yeah, mommy, no, a mommy organization. No, I, yeah. I know them well. Um, Lindsay, the founder, is a friend of mine, and, and that business is just incredible. It's an incredible content business. It's an incredible resource. I just I love her and love that business, and what a great audience for you to have. Um, mm-hmm. So, so all right. So, you know, you're. I love hearing. You know, it's making me so happy. And and this is not a condescending comment, but really proud of you is that you're looking at could have had a parenting from a marketing angle and you're taking and, and I know you're very bright and you know very experienced and so this is something I'm sure you're coming to very naturally and you're also you've done this in, in your past lives and your past jobs but like you've really found your niche and you found a way to message that and you're finding all of these opportunities now like I just I'm, I'm delighted and I'm so psyched for you that you have found like you know FFC and bum club I mean these are like you know obviously we're Chicago we're both Chicago folks and I know all of these things but like guys who are you listening like these are big brands and these are big communities and that you're penetrating that market and you're doing so in a thoughtful meaningful successful way is really really impressive so what advice and we're gonna have to round up our conversation here in a few minutes but before we do I'd love to hear you share some advice with pet business owners or someone who's sure I mean yeah, like, what, yeah, you're what, right. What these are, you know, great things that are happening, but, you know, these things take a lot longer than you think they're going to. <laughs> um, as I'm sure every entrepreneur will tell you or knows, you know, everything is a lot harder than you thought it would be. So my advice to anybody thinking about starting a nonprofit or, or opening a business is you really have to do some soul searching, get some feedback from friends and colleagues that you trust to decide whether you are able and willing to put yourself all in. You know, are you ready mm-hmm. to be the captain of the ship? Sometimes mm-hmm. other people are going to help you. Sometimes they're not around to help you and everything falls on you and you have to be the willing to do the dirty work and the long hours and give up your weekends. But if you're willing to put all that work in there, you're willing to be patient to let all the work take its course, then, you know, you could be really up for a wonderfully satisfying experience doing what you love, um, which is really what we all want to do. But yeah, I would definitely say that you go in it with, <laughs> at least for me, thinking that it's going to be so much easier <laughs> than it actually is. Oh, it's because a you may have a oh, lot of passion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you have a lot of passion and maybe a lot of, of knowledge and information about the, the industry you're going into, the, you know, the pet or child care aspect of it. But for me, I, you know, had to learn about how to run a business, how to do financials, how to, to meet the right people to get my information to the right people. There's a lot of work involved that's not the fun part <laughs> and the fun part <laughs> but is definitely about the necessary part that's right yeah running a business i mean obviously it's it's great when it's an industry that you believe in and that you're passionate about and you have expertise in like that makes it obviously you know it's magnitudes easier than than it is if you didn't have some of those benefits but regardless your point is very well taken from me and probably from every single person listening who either has a business or is looking to start a business that it is it is a grind but not a grind in the cubicle kind of way a grind in the way that there is always something to do and there's never enough time to do it and you have to prioritize and use great tools and be easy on yourself and easy on the people around you, but yet also kind of be hard and, and driven in a way that you didn't ever th- expect, <laughs> didn't ever know that it was going to be You have to be driven. Yes. driven. It's all about That's being exactly driven. right. Yep, I know yeah. it. Oh, I know it. All right. Well, on that note, speaking of being driven, people are get, get back to work. Everybody, go, go get back to work. Start your business. Finish that book. Take an e course. Do what you need to do to move forward in your dreams and what you want to accomplish in this industry or in your life in general. Thank you so much, Alicia. I'm so grateful that you spent time with us. I thought this was a really great conversation. I think you offered so much insight and and really practical information around you know not only what you do but you know kind of the bigger picture of pets and families and just life and business and everything else. This is a really meaningful time for me to have with you and I'm really grateful to you for taking the time. So well, thank you. I've really enjoyed the conversation as well. 
I'm so glad. So, so to reach Alicia, we'll have notes in the show notes, but it is petsarelikefamily.org is the nonprofit side of her, of her business. And then the, the company that we were talking about as far as working with animals and people and their families is called Pitter Patter Parenting. And you can find her on Facebook, Pitter Patter Parenting. Just look that up just like it sounds, Pitter Patter Parenting. And then if you want to get a hold of Alicia, like I said, we'll have her information in the show notes. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to me and I can connect you with her as well. If that's how you want to go about it, whatever you need. And also too, you know, this might be something if you're thinking about making some transitions or trying some things out. Alicia is a great person to talk to because she does have a really nice lens at all the different angles that you can take as far as working um, in the community with people and animals. So on that note, everybody, I want you to have a great day, a great night, a great weekend, a great whatever it is that you are having right now. Just continue to make it good and uh, and, and pet dogs and love people and start businesses and, and do good work and everything works out. All right, guys. Thanks so much. I'm Jimmy McDonald, your host on Pets Mean Business on Pet Life Radio Network. I'll see you next time. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.